And last thing you do with Jay. Oh. <laughs> Sheesh. Okay. Well, Don't let's miss this show on the road. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay. okay. Well, let's get started. Um, the first item on the agenda is approval of the draft minutes. Has everyone had a chance to review the minutes? And are there any changes to the minutes? And if there are none, is there a motion to approve? Too many abstentions. Well, it says attendees, well, and they have my name here. Did I attend this party? Yeah. 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 Were you here? Oh, sure. yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, I'm confusing orientation and. Okay. <laughs> Motion to approve. <laughs> And, and part just I had asked the question um, before we got started about sort of the the formality, the operate the, the organizational formality of this in terms of voting, seconding, or recommendations and all of that. So I just wanted to be clear that like do we go through, do we approve minutes? Do we or I'm assuming these are live streams and all of those things. So feels like board minutes, except for the fact that what we're sending up with our votes is recommendations. Correct. So if you'll have the same Robert's rules. Uh, you guys won't be voting on anything form of yours. Your form of recommendations will be, or your form of votes will be in recommendation. So if the development committee, and this is just a high level example, agrees that we should have uh, solar restaurants and they want to have support letters, the recommendation of the conference committee that the full board adopts support letters. Or well, we have to vote at this level, and then that becomes the record. Yeah. For all meetings will be live streamed. That just seems that a great job about that. In case something happens, we're going to have to be virtual. Sure. So before your rules, we won't have to have it really notice. We're just going to announce it every time that it's going to be live streamed. So if something happens, and tomorrow we can't make it to our recently, we won't have any issues because we've already voted as a live stream. Thank you. That's very helpful. So if we decide to be in opposition to whatever is being discussed. That still is a recommendation that goes back to the full board. Oh, correct. Okay. I'll second. Okay. So there's a motion and a second to approve the minutes. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay. Oh, you're saying? Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay. The next item on the agenda is the Title VI overview. Hey, so Sam. Hello, so they can hear me online if anyone's listening. Um, is that the keyboard to advance the slides or is Joe the one? Okay, great. That's, that's wonderful. Um, good morning, or afternoon. Uh, so um, I'm here today to present uh, kind of an update on the Title VI program. Uh, every three years, we do have to update our Title VI program. Uh, and so that we all know what that is. I'm going to first give a little intro as to what Title VI is. Uh, Title VI refer, refers to a section of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which uh, prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, creed, national origin, and programs and activities receiving federal financial assistance, such as transit. Uh, these protections were extended to low-income individuals with Executive Order 12898 in the 90s, uh, and then Executive Order 13166 uh, further gave protections to people who are, have limited English proficiency. Uh, they wanted to make sure that we make our important programs and documents available to those who may not have uh, as good of an understanding of English. So next slide. So what those laws require us to do is a lot of monitoring and reporting. Uh, some of those monitoring processes are this triennial program review and update, uh, which I'm kind of going over now. Uh, we also have to do uh, analyses anytime there's a major service or fair change. We do level and quality of service analyses, analyses to make sure that all of our assets are being equitably distributed. And of course, we have to address any complaints if someone feels that they have been discriminated against 
uh, they have a right to file a formal complaint and to have it investigated. So going through each of these, uh, these service and fair change analyses, all fair changes get an analysis to determine whether we are disparately or disproportionately bur burdening minority or low income individuals. Um, and with service changes, it's a little bit more of a two-step process. So first we have to determine, is the proposed change a major service change? Um, and then if it is, then we do a full analysis to determine if there were disparate or disproportionate impacts. Um, I've got a list here of what constitutes a major change. Um, I can go into them in green more detail at the end, but I'll spare you for now. Um, go to the next slide. Um, when I say disparate and disproportionate burdens, um, the way that GRTC defines that is if the impact on the low income or minority population uh, is greater than 20 is 20% or more than the impact on the service area as a whole, then that is either a disparate or disproportionate burden or impact, depending on whether you're talking about minority or low income individuals. That 20% um, we are proposing to keep that threshold the same. FTA does let recipients set that threshold. That has traditionally been GRTC's threshold. Um, and we did do a survey as part of this program update. Um, no, we had generally positive feedback on whether the threshold was fair. So we didn't see a reason to change it. So we are proposing keeping that the same. Um, onto the level and quality of service monitoring. Uh, the way that we monitor how our assets are distributed, um, kind of every three years we do a big look at things like the transit access or availability, uh, vehicle headway, loads, basically trying to make sure that things like newer buses are put in, you know, low income and minority communities at the same rate they are in you know, non minority and non low income communities, uh, things like that. And then kind of on a more continuous basis, uh, we try and make sure that things like installing new shelters and benches, um, that we're putting those into minority and low-income areas equitably. Uh, many of you may remember the adoption of the Essential Transit Infrastructure Plan back in August. Um, you know, the equity score is a big piece of where, how we determine where those investments are going. So we do try to do that kind of on a continuous basis to make sure we're holding ourselves accountable. Um, the third, monitoring item was addressing complaints. Um, we do have a formal complaint form. Um, customer service makes that available to anyone who thinks that they've been discriminated against. Um, we do post it also on our website. Uh, we try to make it as easy to find as possible. We also post notices on all of our vehicles and at the GRTC facility notifying people of their rights and protections under Title VI. Uh, and we have this in both, or in English, Spanish, um, and I believe Vietnamese and Arabic. Um, and those are all available on our website um, as well. So why I'm here, the program update for 2023, um, I'm just gonna highlight what the changes are so you know what is different. Um, we are kind of trying to give ourselves more flexibility in the public engagement for our service change analyses. When we do these service change analyses, you know, part of what we're called to do is to engage the writers, engage the public, um, and get their feedback on proposed changes. Um, so traditionally we've said it has to be a public meeting or public hearing. Um, we want to give ourselves more flexibility because it's not always the best, people, best way to reach people, uh, especially in these times. You know, we want to be able to meet virtually. We want to be able to do a pop-up. Um, you know, if we're cut, proposing cutting an express route, uh, maybe going out and riding the bus and surveying people directly is the best way to reach those riders. Um, so we just want to have the flexibility to kind of plug and play the right type of engagement with the uh, with the proposed change. Obviously, public meetings are still going to be a big part of what we do, um, especially for big changes like the structural changes to the one in the A, B, and C that we just completed in January. Um, so that's still part of our arsenal. Um, we've streamlined the complaint form. Uh, we tried to simplify it, make it easier to read. Um, a lot less boxes to check and less formal language, uh, more opportunity for people to write in and fill in, you know, what they felt, how they felt they were discriminated against. Um, so try and making it easier on the writers to submit formal complaints. Uh, and in addition to that, we've implemented simplified reporting with our customer service staff. 
they now know instead of uh, having to you know check a box in their system and then it gets routed you know all through these different departments at GRTC they the moment someone uh, expresses that they feel they've been discriminated against customer service is to either offer to send them this form via email or mail or to help them fill it out on the phone and then send it to them for signature um, but that immediately starts a formal Title VI complaint once someone has completed that form. So it makes it hopefully easier on the user and easier on us to track and respond to. Um, I think those were all of the proposed changes. Um, if there were any questions, um, we do plan to go to the full board in March to request formal board approval of the new 2023 Title VI program. The draft program is on our website. Uh, it's at that address there on the slide, so it's there for your review uh, and comment if you want me to do it. Is your Could that be forwarded to us? Sorry. Sir. Um, one question you, you talked about service changes. Does Title VI tie in at all to expansion of service? Yes. When, so, for instance, if you're looking at new routes, what types of things do you have to evaluate on that? And is that considered against the whole of the rest of the system? And it's making it, tell me about that. Yes, it is uh, considered against the whole rest of the system, you know, an expansion of service. Um, Joe, yeah, he's got it already. <laughs> um, yeah, so adding routes uh, would be, you know, if we added a whole new route, and then if we expanded the system in a way that changed, uh, you know, the length of a certain route, it would probably trigger one of these you know, thresholds and change in total miles or change in total daily revenue, um, like revenue hours, you know, things like that. So there's a couple, of, there's multiple ways it can trigger a major service change and it likely would, um, that those routes, those changes would be kind of reviewed against how does this new service fare versus the existing system that's in place today. That yeah, I'm, I'm trying to that. So sometimes we will find that there's a new reason to go to a new area or something like that. The, mm -hmm. the bus rapid transit or the, the new uh, north south. Um, and, and the idea that <clears throat> what that is looked at, I'm just using the term opportunity, the use of that as an opportunity to expand the system and to expand the reach of GRTC. Then the, what what your description came in is basically we have to go back and look at what else is not being done elsewhere because of that is uh, that, that no. might be underserved or anything like that. Not so, quite like that. No, okay. it's more saying what's the change in person trips with this with the addition gotcha. of this okay. new gotcha. yeah. Just just the what's the data? What's the data result of that expansion? Okay. Gotcha. So, right. so filing complaints. Um, They would, if they're following the complaint, they would have to fall within what protection is provided under Title VI. Yes. Right. And how do you process those filings? And if someone is not, does not agree with the findings, is there another stage? Sure. So um, you have 180 days from the date that the incident happened to file your complaint. Um, once the complaint is received by GRTC, the Title VI officer, who's currently our planning manager, um, is responsible for initiating an investigation within five days, notifying that person that an, an investigation has been initiated. And then it then becomes an internal process of determining whether it was valid, and then um, the validity or the invalidity is communicated to that person. To your point, if uh, we deemed it not valid and the person wants to appeal that, you can uh, appeal that process, I believe, to the FTA directly. Um, they have a form on the FTA website and I, you know, we can make that available to people uh, so they don't have to go hunting for it. Um, so there is another level that people can go to. And we also, as part of the uh, triennial review process that the agency goes through every three years on all of its, you know, various programs and pieces of the agency. Uh, we do have to provide FTA with a list of all Title VI investigations uh, that were initiated and what the outcome was. Uh, and they have the right to ask us for additional information in determining whether or not we were accurate in how we determined whether the, the complaint was valid. FTA is what? FTA, the FTA. Federal Transit Administration. I apologize. Yeah. Okay. 
Do we get many complaints? No, we, um, I believe we only had one for the past three years. And prior to that, I think it was either two or three for the prior reporting period. Okay. I have a hypothetical philosophical question and a specific question. So when you're looking at major changes in service, so let's say we're looking to expand in a quarter that doesn't currently have service, but that is not an area that they okay, um, disadvantaged population, but it's providing service to an area that has jobs, for example, in the, in the quarter, the Route 1 North quarter, or the West Quad quarter. So we extend BRT down further down Broad Street. I know there's some disadvantage here, and but you get the short pump, it's not disadvantage. So does the Title VI analysis take into account that you're providing access to jobs for the entire system by extension into these corridors versus you're, you're not putting the service in a disadvantaged population area? Is that considered? It is considered because we use a software called TBEST to model the people trips that would be taken on the existing network versus the proposed network. And so if you know, there's a benefit to low income or minority populations have access to these jobs in, you know, maybe not a low income or minority area, then that's going to show up in increased minority low income person trips model. So we'll see that. Um, yeah, is that? Yes. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's basically just grabbing the population and then, was it a, we were half a mile or a quarter of a mile? I think we do. It's either a quarter or three. Does it depend on the kind of route? What's that? Does it depend on the route also? Like BRT might be a bigger swath. Than no, we, we set the parameters. And I think it's a quarter mile right now. It's what is a more realistic walking. And so it'll grab that. And then what it does, it looks at the population as a whole, what it is without that, and what it does with it. If it skews you, so those 20, 20 percentage points, you stay within that as far as the overall change in the system from what it was before, um, then you're okay. Um, if you're not okay, let's say it's 21%, the board can still choose to move forward. However, you'll determine ways to mitigate it. So let's say you did that, but you decide you want to maybe add a frequency out in the east end somewhere like that. Um, so that's say you can't move forward, but it's about the whole system. So even though it's one route that's being added, that might actually be diluted in terms of the whole system as a whole. We'll We'll move to my specific question. So, beginning with COVID 19, we discontinued service on three of the four express routes in Penica. Um, to my knowledge, we did not have public outreach other than just notifying providers of those locations to put us on the website. So, that was considered a temporary um, service. Uh, change, but we're now four years into it, four years into it, and I think we have plans to reinstate service at most of those facilities. Does that need to be documented, reviewed somewhere in Title VI, or we just moved on? So we actually did go back and do service change analyses for each of those booking changes between uh, March 2020 and August of uh, 2022 that we went back and did that and we did bring it before the board uh, to approve the resolution. Um, so we we did go through the process. It was just kind of belated. FTA was kind of giving agencies some leeway uh, during COVID, but we went back and made sure that we. Uh, that must have been the course on the board. I, don't um, I can't remember what it was around when we did. We did the fair analysis at the same time because we were approaching. So it might have been in the summer, but the only one that really triggered, I think, was the fours out in Fulton. Um, and we just said that we will plan to be putting service back. Um, full, that and then the pulse also triggered service because it was substantial in terms of removing the moving the service on it. But because I guess we looked at it as a system, I don't think the express routes. Trigger one probably because of the characteristics that go so far out. So. Oh, and if I may, uh, Carrie and I actually went out to those fiber eye lots. It's out early in the morning, and that was all the 
those yeah. customers. Make sure they no, I, I do remember there was good outreach and communication with the customers at the time, but it's temporary. Yeah. We, we all assumed it was temporary yeah. and we found not a lot of complaints are not bringing it back. Demand still a fraction of what it was. So I just want to make sure we were covering ourselves in the highest extent. Yeah, yes. we did do that. And I think we also went under the five the mitigation effort was to continue to watch the 29 and add trips to it. So you're required to update this every three years. Is that when you do the reporting also, or do you report annually on Title uh, Six? The so it's the reporting is uh, every three years to FDA. I think the triennial reporting I mentioned. Um, our program update happens to be coinciding in the same year. We have a triennial review this time. Um, we don't. We don't do an annual review, but we do do those service changes, uh, as should care changes as we go as needed. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anyone else questions on this? Do we need to? Um, you said you're bringing this to the full board at the next meeting. We will be requesting board approval at the March meeting. Um, we were not planning to do a full briefing to the board. Uh, it's kind of dense material, but um, yeah, I think that's at the discretion of you all as to whether you want one, to recommend that we do. One of her one of her biggest answers to me was to the question of how many complaints were there over the last three years, and it was one. I think I'm satisfied with this briefing that they're doing the right thing to streamline and all of that. So I, I hope so. I'm happy to report. We've gotten it ready to bring it to the full board. Okay. So, is that a motion to recommend uh, the board approval of the Title VI update and reporting? That's much better said than I did. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay. Let's do that. Yeah. I, I, I move that we recommend the board approval. Okay. Is there a second? March. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay. So just for example, so you guys know, picture of March meeting, when you have a committee report coming from you, Barb, it's going to say that this committee recommended the approval of Title VI. It won't be like a formal vote cast or separate yes. recommendation. Yes. And we'll have those three bullet points of the changes that are being made so that we can share that with the board. Yes. We'll, we'll include that as part of this little packet. And, and as part of that, um, because there's probably education that's needed with many of the other board members, TOs overview in some form of what Title VI is all about. Is just well, this presentation happened in the board. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 If, if, if that's your decision, we're happy to do that. But I guess the trade off is we're trying to keep those board meetings right. pretty streamlined. So Maybe it's not a full presentation, but maybe it's Sam standing up there and giving a even more concise. Uh, I, I think she, she did great here, but do we need to give them a snippet of what it is? I don't know that they all know. It's kind of it's, it's, this aspect is very unique to trans. What was helpful to me was one the background of what, what is Title VI. Mm -hmm. that, that's always helpful. You give that. Thank you. You give that, and then that those three recommendations as to how it's going to change. To me, that's that's that trusting board, the board trusting the committees. I don't think that I don't think anybody's going to be begging for more info on that. You might even plug in to the commentary that over the last three years there was one complaint, and that ask, answers the question before they're even asked. I think that makes sense. Okay, good with that. Yeah, so consensus on that approach. You think we're good? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, next on the agenda is expansion initiative updates. Transit advisory. Advisory. What's that? Transit oh, advisory. I'm sorry. Transit advisory. Um, this will be very brief. I just to provide you with an intro. Update on we have just rebranded the transit riders 
advisory group. We have the world wide. Thank you. Okay. So I'm not sure the exact year that this was first introduced. Was it 2016 or yes. somewhere around that time? Yes. Um, the previous board actually had requested us to do kind of a, a writer advisory group um, as a, another input for the board as well as us of what perception and uh, experience of writers actually out in our network. Um, because of COVID, this ended, um, but at this point we are ready to bring it back. Um, we have had initial conversations with um, RV Rapid Transit. Uh, let's say kind of a lessons learned from the first one was that our the larger demographic of our writers were not well represented in um, the individuals who were in um, the group. So working with RV Rapid Transit and they're out there in the community, making sure we have more of the Title VI and the origin of nation in our actual representation of writers. Um, within the complement of the Transit Writer Advisory Group. So we're gonna work with them on that. But the way that worked, they met four times a year, um, so quarterly. Uh, they had an agenda they went through. A lot of it was about just their experience on time performance, initiatives that we had put forward, um, and any other maybe sort of forward interest items from the writer perspective they would discuss. It is set up pretty formal. They have a chair, and they have a chair, or secretary. Um, this time around, we actually want to provide an incentive for them. Again, it's that group that we want to make sure get a little more incentive to get them there. It's like an opportunity cost where they're working. Um, so we put down here $75 a meeting, so quarterly for them to attend. Uh, we wanted to kick it off in July, have the application start March 1st for about 30 days, and then actually align them. Our day about the transit runs a transit university which they have funding, there's some grants for educating on what is the deeper dive and trains and all the stuff that we go over that's way more complicated um, than the end user typically thinks about um, so that they can have that sort of knowledge when they actually are part of the group. And then the formal meeting would start in October when they would reflect their chairs or vice chairs um, and secretary. And they would be up uh, annually um, and have exceed maximum three consecutive year terms. Uh, we were thinking once it's up and running that they also would be able to do a brief report out to you guys. Or we were thinking the development to the agenda item, which is quarterly, if that would match, um, as an input from the writer perspective. They have a similar one, um, Care Advisory Committee, uh, which we're also looking at bringing back for that one before we get the full So it was just for you to have to take with you. Um, Go through if you guys have any comments or say it would start a lot. So you said applications are due. This is all for the planning, but we wanted to open it up on March 1st, keep it open for 30 days. So close it on the 1st of April about, and then review applications um, for about two to three weeks um, and letting them know when the when the application opens up that they would be incentivized to attend the Transit University um, which starts May 1st. So I think as I looked at the list of attendees, I, I made a mistake looking at the second page sort of in detail first. And so I got my head now this is going to be a bunch of really young people. It's, they're all over the place in terms of age and so forth, backgrounds and all that. Yeah. It's, it, that just happens to be representation of the EU and the C one at one each. But the others, it's not this aim at uh, any, any demographic other than from Richmond, from Chester. Correct, correct. And it used to be the jurisdictions, Petersburg, and then the three at large. But knowing that with the Colts now, that there's a large representation of VCU, their perspectives, and similarly our writers, um, and similarly with the EU, and then we want, of course, that care perspective for those who use good scraps. We can, of course, make any tweaks um, from those who use mobility device or um, just gets into the game. With that answer about the makeup, I'm less worried about the answer to this question. Are they in person or the program is virtual or not? Uh, in person. Okay, and we're thinking we'll do kind of a series that's close to a line. We used to have them at City Hall in the uh, planning boardroom, planning conference room. 
Um, still an option for looking maybe at the plan RVA and on Whole Street. Um, what else do we say? It's a bit of a chamber. Oh, the chamber of Commerce, places that people can actually access. Um, they could now come here. We had them originally here, but we didn't always have limited network reason on that actually got routes. We actually didn't have any traded routes before. Um, so we could also have one of them here. Will you be asking localities to appoint people? We were not going to ask them to appoint them. Um, if you have someone to recommend to apply, I think that would be great. Okay, so you're just going to work with uh, RBA Rapid Transit? I mean, they would help to just funnel people into the application. If there's other ways to do it as well, we'll have it on our website. Um, we're not limited to RBA Rapid Transit anywhere. But the key is the regular ride. Correct, yes. that is, the, that is yes. why they're there. Yeah. Yes. We want you said you had this before, <laughs> and how valuable was it? It is, this is a different model that we're hoping to get, not that they weren't real writers before, but we're hoping that this will be uh, actually present the writers who are the majority of our demographic. Um, so as far as value, I would say the things that they touch on a quarterly basis, they'd ask things like, how can you improve performance on this route? But they would get an answer of how we're gonna do it for like four months. Um, I, we haven't gone through it, but I think the structure should be an almost annual agenda that they have set items and they actually participate in some of our projects. So that if there's big things coming up, we can get their value as projects progress, or if they like the more sell, they can help us. They'd be that particular group that we make sure we're stakeholders. Do you think it would be a, a, a cool thing or a detriment to potential members if we plugged it such that once a year the group will come to the board meeting and present goals, whatever it might be? And, it, even though it's open to anyone, every, yeah. every meeting's open, just sort of the vibe of, and this group will annually uh, uh, come as a group and be presented, thanked, and all that stuff, and provide their report for the last year and a vision for the next or something like that. A few guys, but it sounds great. No, I said it was initially was an initiation from the board. Uh, Why did the board feel they needed more writers into it? I mean, you're getting writers in the, by several different means now, right? You do. Uh, or are they specific to right. changes and those kind of things that you get? So this is like ongoing. This yeah, I think this would be a deeper dive because we'll give them the understanding of what it actually takes to run things so they can give their perspective that we can also share and almost work together um, on coming up with solutions. Okay. We also want them to be advocates for our audience and experiences and things like that. So they can be boots on the ground telling everyone the right book for them in our south or our micro transits and things like that. And I would say I mean, our public engagement meetings usually are three people who show up, um, not necessarily even showing up for that topic. Uh, it's just kind of a requirement, as you saw, for us to do it. But people are, fortunately, they're not going to care unless it actually impacts them. And it's already been initiated or implemented. So we do do, as she said, like I think the best way to reach people is to go out to buses and talk to people. So if we can bring those people here before it happens, it would be useful. Okay. Yeah, I like the idea of having sort of a standing committee that we can um, present these ideas, microtransit and BRT and all those projects in a bajillion that you guys are working on. So that sounds good. The representation and perspective to your volume of clientele, um, my perception is that the majority of the riders uh, within the routes of and within the city. So Chesterfield has significantly less probably right. than that two routes today yeah. two that is correct we did discuss um weighting it based on the percent of riders in the jurisdictions not that it would be completely per percent but like city of richmond could get three chesterfield could get one and Rico could get two and the other stay as is that was I'm only raising it from the perspective of the feedback that you get from right. riders and the, 
the volume of riders that are Richmonders versus um, the volume that you may be getting and the number of routes that you have in the other two locations. Yeah. I mean, there are folk that ride the bus in Richmond that probably don't even know one other side of the city other than the side that they ride on, you know. Um, yeah, and and so possibly different feedback from riders who who are who live in and work in different parts too. I mean, uh, the, the the profile or the, the makeup of somebody's response to somebody that's in Chacabano who uses it daily might be very different than that of somebody who uses it from somewhere else. Absolutely. Uh, so she's got a really good point about about the, is the, is it dynamic that they're from Richmond or from different parts of Richmond where that sort of make up these routes. That, that's kind of interesting. I was actually thinking, in a, you know, the VCU students, the, the general knee jerk is to say, well, that's Pulse Rider. But I, I was wondering if it made sense to have somebody on here who is a dedicated Pulse Rider daily. Um, you know, whether, because again, what we're doing is we're getting feedback from different types of users or use it for different reasons that might provide better insight. Yeah, I mean, my initial thought is I'd say it. Most likely, a typical writer at some point is writing the polls to space on like, where you go and the way our system is set up. But what about the person who uses polls every day? Who's, that's their exclusive use. And in the last board meeting, Sam shared some information about you know the numbers on Broad Street that you know the or the the development that's happening on and along Broad Street. It, it was. Um, interesting to me and I think something more of a deeper dive of, of understanding development around our system so that we can understand how we can potentially capture that. And I think somebody who lives in Scott's edition and works at the Capitol or somebody who works at Willow Lawn and what you know who does that every day yeah. might be very different from a VCU student when we start having to negotiate with VCU about wanting out of our you know the, the agreement. So I, I'm making too much of it, probably, but I, to, to, to your point about makeup of ridership, a lot of it is downtown, but the, even the users downtown have a lot of different different purpose. So this is a great, so is this, is this what was before, or has this been rewritten? It's been uh, edited. Okay. Not too much, we didn't buy seven before, we changed uh, some of the amounts. ECU wasn't on there before. Care wasn't on there before. Majority of the thing. Um, I think starting is better than nothing. Jay Sarger Reynolds? Then, then it can always be expanded. Jay Sarger Reynolds, include them as a an option. Um, and I do think that. Um, I don't know. I, you all know what your ridership is. You, I mean, if you had to categorize your ridership, do you feel like the rep, the recommendation of representation align with your with your ridership? I mean, I know that um, with the exception of the pulse, and that's changed a lot of things as it relates to ridership. Um, if the two representatives of the city of Richmond be someone who goes to the university out in the West End. And in, in a lot of cases, low income people, which make up a large share of our riders, mm -hmm. don't have the flexibility to come to right. meetings. And I think the $75 would make a difference, could be. A, could make some difference, mm -hmm. uh, but wherever the meeting is being held, if I've got to pay a fare uh, from Churchill to come over here and be on the bus for an hour and a half, uh, that's true. Yeah. Okay, yeah. let's just say 30 minutes, because uh, that's about how long it takes me to drive over here. Um, and I'm driving. Um, I, I'm just, I want to make sure that the representation gives the voice that we want to make sure we hear everyone. And if 50% of your riders are low income families, then 
the representation of seeing two people from the city or two people from Chesterfield and two people as if they're equal as far as ridership is not the case. Yeah. And I'm concerned about whether or not you hear all of the voices that you want to hear. Yes, what are some thoughts as far as number changes? Uh, um, well, it sounded like you were engaging RVA Rapid Transit to be sure that you were trying to, you were getting a group of people that reflected the demographics and ridership. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how to spell that out here um, or to guarantee it. Yeah. You know, a lot of times we have really good intentions with committees and you can't get anyone to really participate. Mm -hmm. um, it's true too. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense, just like the feedback you've already gotten that this committee needs to reflect the ridership yeah. better. Um, what about the shift from the city of Richmond to the three just built the one based on the calendar? We're fine with that. Okay. Do that and then and the city's got the students too. Mm -hmm. And that's been sure. Okay. Um, I didn't think about the transportation piece. We can still talk about RV Rapid Transit also about if there is someone who really had a transportation issue and it would be an hour and a half, then you can figure out a way to get there. Even if it's paying for an Uber each way or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So is this require action of the board? No. Okay. All right. All right. Next item on the agenda really is expansion <laughs> initiative update. All right. Um, so I'm here to slide little project updates. I apologize for the difference. Uh, here to update you on some of our expansion activities. Uh, We've got going on some big projects. Joe, if you could advance to the first slide. Uh, one of the biggest projects we have going on right now is, of course, the construction of our new temporary downtown transfer station. Uh, it's at the intersection of, or bounded by 8th, 9th, uh, Clay, and Lee Streets, downtown Richmond. Uh, this is funded uh, by a $2.2 million grant. Uh, and we also have an additional $1.5 million uh, that we're investing in usable capital assets for the location. Um, this is you know, a temporary home for us for a few years, but these assets are ones that can be moved once we find a permanent home for our downtown transfer activities. Uh, the work is about 70% complete now. A substantial concrete work uh, has been completed on the islands. Uh, you know, we're we're starting to see uh, the opening here on the horizon. Uh, the tentative opening date will be May 21st. It's a Sunday, uh, coincide with the new booking, so schedule changes. Uh, and we will be kind of reorienting our service to serve this for the entirety of the transit day. The current transfer plaza, uh, some of you may know, is only served on nights and weekends. So we'll be making sure that our bus service is going in here um, for the entirety of the transit day. Did you say a specific date for opening or just May, May 21st? May 21st. That is technically still tentative. We are feeling pretty comfortable about it. Question. Yes. So, is there any rerouting needed to serve this? Yes. Um, some routes are being rerouted. Uh, mostly, it's routes that have a different night and weekend pattern and a different day pattern today. You know, based on whether they serve the transfer plaza or not. Uh, and we're kind of using that night and weekend pattern to be the all the time pattern. Uh, but there are some like the 56 or the 50 that we are extending to uh, go all the way to the new transfer station. So uh, we will be you know, conducting a kind of six analysis and uh, seeing if any major service changes are triggered with that. Uh, or analyses are triggered with that. Second question, is there any sunset on the use of this site? Yes. Uh, is it like a hard date though, or? It's a five-year lease um, that can be renewed or also ended. And uh, when did it start? 
uh, date of signing, which was, I think, July of 2022. And any other facilities, bathrooms, there will anything be, like that that's going to be there at the site? There will be an operator restroom at the site. Operator restroom? Restroom. Restroom. Bathroom. Yeah. Uh, just just yeah. Just yeah. Yeah. We've had good weather for <laughs> this project. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Our paving was this week, I think. This the weather? Or was it this Thursday and Friday? This week, yeah. yeah. This week. Are you paving this Thursday and Friday? Hopefully it's raining. Well. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any provisions to break the lease? Um, at least there's a is your yes, yeah. the city's lease. Um, there's a certain amount of notification time then before we have to exit and vice versa. So there may be opportunities to extend it if uh, yeah, there is. Say if the city doesn't need the site and you have a ton of permanent so. Right. It just was more of a tool that made it more formal. We need to find a permanent site. We are, this is this is like it was an ongoing continual problem. It is. And it's it's been challenging. It has not been resolved, you know. And we are consistently putting in temporary mm -hmm. transfer sites downtown that are that are not not what a well. transfer site should be and what it should consist of. And you know, I mean, I've gone to other transfer centers in other cities and states, and you know, we need to we need to be intentional about finding a permit. We're putting a lot of money yeah, into yes. a lot of concrete yeah. that's yeah. going to be broken up mm -hmm. and another use put in and you know preventing the grids of the streets to be done the way that we need them to be done downtown. Um, and it's like a demand for a transfer station and consistently coming up with temporary locations. And Greater Richmond Transit needs to select a permanent transfer station location and let the board work to make that happen. And whether it's one or whatever, I mean, we go from, do we need one? Do we need more than one? You know, we have all of these uh, conversations and I know a lot of conversations and plans and proposals and lots of things, but I would really challenge this committee if this is part of our uh, due diligence as it relates to the board is to be intentional about what we're going to do to, I hope, be able to find a permanent place before this five-year lease up so that when this five-year lease is up, we've already made, put the facility in place so we can make the transfer. That's a motion on second. <laughs> <laughs> It's a motion and a request. <laughs> Everybody's benefit. Is that something we could dig into more maybe at our next meeting? Start to start kind of that conversation. Absolutely. About the challenges that we've seen through the years. Get yeah, that one's ready to go. <laughs> and I think it would be good to give that context to the full board so that to her point we're all aware of it and we all start moving in the same direction. Yeah. Do you want to put it as a full board agenda item? I think the committee needs to do a lot more yeah. work and come up with some really solid recommendations that we want to make, taking everything in consideration. I mean, there's a lot to take in consideration. I mean, this is not a, this is not, unless we have a special committee meeting just to focus in on that, this is a big conversation. Yeah. It really is. And but I think there's new money that we are experiencing now that if we start working on this in the way that we need to, we may be able to get this done without money being an issue. I know land is a location in land and what fits into your system. You know, I'm not trying to define all that. I'm just saying that you guys can do that best. But I think now with sources of revenue that are not going to continue, but it's, a, it's available. Um, I think our, our, what I'd like to be saying to the board is the board, we want the board to adopt the spirit of this five-year lease 
is a grace period for us to finalize a permanent transfer station and have it ready at the end of this five year lease. Somebody I think that's a goal to create opportunities for us to so, so maybe in the course of the committee update that Barb will be getting to the full board to say that this would be an initiative that this committee is going to dig in the staff and come back to the board at a later date for anything. And in five years, minus June of last year, whenever it was the last year, the time is ticking. It seems to me that between this and our next committee meeting, it would be a reasonable ask if the staff could outline for us what you see the next two years of finding it. What 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 is the process? Identifying the things that haven't worked. I think you know, hiring a consultant for site evaluation, looking at available sites, looking at routes, all that kind of stuff, so that we can say, okay, what does the next four and a half years look like? Is so that when five years comes into place, we are actually constructed and right. ready not to ask for extended extended leases. And in construction, with that in front of us, it's almost like we're at critical path now, to your point, mm -hmm. um, to, to start that process. So, but um, my ask would be, uh, again, don't know if it was a vote or whatever, but can we get maybe an outline or some kind of a, 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 yeah, just an outline of a schedule of what you believe as a staff would need to happen to get to that point of permanent location? Not, not the answers of where the location is, but what that process looks like. Sure. We can provide that. I think it'd be great. Um, and I'd also like to mention, we have applied for state funding for a study next year to do that kind of initial look at what, what do the site requirements need to be? Uh, what's the potential economic impact of having a permanent home downtown? Uh, things of that nature to kind of get us started down that path. So hopefully we will be successful in that grant request. So next be state up. fiscal year, yeah. starting July. Starting July. We could do pre-award if we need to kick it off sooner. So I, you know, I mean, you guys know what you're doing, uh, and you have a schedule for that. And I know this is a desire that Ray Richmond Transit has had for years, so this is nothing new. If you apply for a grant, um, Madam Chair, I would suggest that we work in that timeline rather than uh, a lot of a lot of work has been done to get to a point of making an application for the grant. So we will make sure that we know that we receive the grant and then we have a work plan as to what we're going to do to do the analysis and the study and all of those kinds of things. Still with the intention of trying to get something done and done fast. That's a short window. I mean, it's a short window to develop, to finalize, find a location and bill it. By five years, but by us paying attention to it, that pattern or that schedule now, we may also know that we're going to need two more years on the lease uh, because we're in the we're in the middle of doing a major redevelopment plan for downtown, and that's a primary location, and it's it's our plan that is going to go. Not going to stay there. Um, but we know what happened with the last one that was supposed to be a temporary just for a few years that has gone on for. I will make a statement that years. we're going down the effort of doing an economic development study because it always comes down to we are not the best use of any site. Mm -hmm. We have federal dollars that just aren't marketable in terms of people who want to sell their property. We even offered to do some sort of coordination that we have money to purchase this property. Um, it was pushed back on that as far as the value, all the stuff that the city said about uh, it, like everything you just said, it's just got the, one of the best value properties in the city. Nothing is built on it. It's basically ready to go. We're not going to go to GRTC. So I think I went before four times before planning commission and finally they agreed to give us a lease. Um, otherwise, they weren't going to let us use it. So I we did a study, we looked at the whole CBD area and beyond. It was like 15 or so sites, conceptual designs and everything. We are not at the end of it was we are not the best use, as well as the business organizations did not want to be next to a transit facility. Mm -hmm. So the Navy Hill was beneficial to us because we were wrapped in. Um, mm -hmm. It wasn't what was seen. So I think even doing study, whether it ends up being a location, I mean, we're looking at to show that trend or brand development, we had similar competition earlier, it is a real thing. So 
if we can show the economic value of it, of why it needs to be there, you're doing mixed use development down there, all of that, that's kind of the angle we want to go to show that we, even though we may not be the best use on our own, incorporate us. Um, looking at something more like a public private partnership, we can give funds to go towards it. I would kind of challenge, I think that's going to end up being where we are anyway. So if it's a way for you guys to help us figure that out, um, even with the Navy Hill, was like, well, how do our federal dollars go into a private company that's doing investments? When are they getting like we never got to have that conversation and we were confused to how we would even get there. But if we could have conversations like that now and figure out how we could be a part of the developers project, even if it is that site. I mean, well, I could show you also in several PowerPoints. It ends up being that everybody wants to go downtown. We're two blocks from the Pulse. Uh, government station is second to Willow Lawn. Um, we have some need for some transfer centers in the suburban or peripheral areas that are still need, but as far as the full destination, People work downtown, Pulse is downtown. Um, I think people have argued about the north south. It'll probably end up somewhere in that downtown area as well. So I would also suggest that there's representation from this committee um, that is designated to be a part of this central plan that's being done downtown right now. Mm -hmm. And that you are know, at the table <laughs> making your argument of being included. In the plan, whether it's you know the private part, whatever, to create that inclusion with whatever design that consists of, uh, because if you don't, we'll be in the process of putting together another downtown plan, and you all weren't at the table, and then you know you're sitting there, you know, like okay. Yep. This is temporary, so we're just planning on moving it. Uh, because from the city's perspective, we've got mixed messages from the board, from some of your board members, as to whether or not, first of all, do you need a transfer station? Secondly, do you need one transfer station or you need several? And so there was never any clarity as it relates to where we want to go. Now we are we. <laughs> we serve both sides of the table, okay? So, and we are in the process of putting together an extremely detailed redevelopment plan for this area. And it's in the sixth district, which I read. So, all sounds so wonderful. So, uh, <laughs> so, so yeah, I'm so thinking good. be at the table, be at the table, make your voice known, help me appreciate that value. I'm willing to argue for that support. But we need to be prepared to do that. Yes. So, in writing the notes, should I, should I write that uh, Councilman Ross and volunteers? <laughs> I think we need someone in addition to Councilman mm -hmm. Ross because Councilman Ross is going to be there anyway. But I think having, I think the regional perspective now that we have put on the branding of who Greater Richmond Transit is requires us to have that input also as a representative. I'm going to be there. So are you going to reach out to Jeroen and get I've, on this? I've had conversations with Marissa. I said the, kind of the same exact thing. That even like in the dining district, I said, you guys are already so far along and you're talking about transitory development, but yet you don't want us at the table. To be honest, we were told that we work through um, What's the transit version we're doing now? Um, with the road is first study oh, that they're yeah, doing Richmond Connect. Richmond Connect that will be brought in at that point. And I don't I don't agree with that. I think that we should have been brought in at the beginning and be at the table. Um, no. So I think leaning on you, I think you have to help us get no there. Problem. I mean, just tell me what I need to do. I, really appreciate I think that. it's a waste of time to yeah. I think it's a disservice for us to not be at the table now and up front. And I'm willing, I'm willing to do whatever you ask me to do. Uh, if that means we need to meet with the planning with Marissa and so forth, and let's talk about the central plan and you know give them some concept of what you guys are thinking, wherever we are, that kind of thing. But your timing and what we want to present, just say the word. <clears throat> Rabbit hole time, and I'll promise not to go far down. <laughs> but what you said about not being invited despite your efforts, can you give a very, very quick summary as to why you think that 
that invitation is not there earlier? I just think it's, I think across the region, the understanding of transit, and I talked about the floor as far as like an end user thinking about from that aspect. Not really, really. I do think that we even like uh, had several conversations about what, why do you need a transit mm -hmm. center? Um, that's perception. right, right. Okay. Not understanding. Well, that's not going to help if we're not able to change that perception. Uh, and if the message is not right, clear, right. and if the message is not clear, because we'll get we've been getting Better accusing news. messages, yes. you know. Um, know. And so now I'm I'm greater than transit. Our voice needs to be one voice yeah. and solid, you know. Um, obviously the city has continued to be willing to do a temporary something. So um, we probably recognize the fact that it needs to be somewhere in downtown Richmond, right? Mm -hmm. um, certainly makes a better sense than having it on land that the city already owned and trying mm -hmm. to buy it from the private sector, okay? Unless we decide that some other location works best for the company, and only you all can help us appreciate that and make that decision. But that's when the cost gets too high, right? As far as the dollars that are brought, I mean, if there's time to the dollars, yes. Unless it's an off the market property that's willing to engage us. But you also done the work historically to show what works operationally to grab mm -hmm. land. So there's, that's already been and there's a parcel size limitation as well. So that's already been done. That can be revisited and Right. And we did look at the surplus property, knowing that's probably the best thing that are not private. Is your economic development study going to look at um, other localities, other you know transit agencies, and what they've done? You know, up in Nova with transit oriented, yeah, transit oriented development. Yes, I, well, that was my and I how I imagine we do a peer review because we're not reinventing something here. Someone's already done it. So proving that it probably works somewhere else. Yes. Okay. Well, okay. I'm going to see this meeting at the low level. Okay. All right. Let's <laughs> see. <laughs> um, so we began the North South BRT study back in November, and that is a nine month study that will wrap up in uh, late July, uh, sorry, late August, early September. Um, we are currently uh, kind of about midway through this little diagram on the right. Uh, we have defined the corridors and the purpose and need. We had our first stakeholder meetings last month. Uh, we have both a technical advisory committee and a stakeholder advisory committee uh, that we will meet with three times through the course of the study. Um, our study corridors, they're based off the Greater Washington Partnership work. Um, our goal here is to say, this is the elephant. We want improved transit everywhere in these corridors, but what bite should we take off first? What makes the most sense to have BRT first? It is probably some combination of those lines on the map. You know, it probably won't go all the way up to Hanover. Uh, it might not go all the way out to Commonwealth 20, uh, but what makes sense to have, to have BRT first in a north-south direction? And then also what other transit improvements can we make in the rest of these corridors to you know sow the seeds for future BRT potentially. Um, so, so how far west does the exist, existing bus rapid transit go? Uh, it goes to Willow Lawn. That's it. Okay. So I spoke to Adrian about this. Um, I don't know if she shared it with you, but I did want to share with this group. Um, Part of the Midlothian Business Alliance, I sit in on those meetings, and this was actually presented. I did not know this was going to be on the, the, the topic, so I'm like, oh, okay. And it was your presentation. Two of the members of that group, which is a very, very um, good group to partner with when we start talking about this, so kudos to who's on there. Um, their take was that this was a quick go, a vote that was taken. Again, they're excited about it that these Chesterfield lines were looked at, which one would you want to prioritize? So it was a vote, and then it was decided that it would be Route 60. So communication is going to be important to say, you know, I think the term straw poll was used, and, and in their mind- Route 60 over in their, the north-south 
Oh, well, in yeah. their mind, in their mind, <laughs> what they heard at the end of that was that it will that that now this map's going to change to this and this. Um, and and again, I, what what ultimately happens? I think we're still evaluating all those systems, mm -hmm. and you know, one is oper more opportunity bear choice ridership based and the other one is more needs based and so we got to keep that balance particularly as title six and so forth but just like i was talking about with brt downtown and looking at development zones that actually allow for the expansion of long term strategically of the transit i think it, it's really valuable to keep in mind what's happening around rather than just the ridership it's like seeing seeing what developments are in the pipeline what areas and, and I don't know how deep a dive conference plans are evaluated and so forth, but uh, the route to the west is very much an opportunity and a growth opportunity. The route to the south is more of a needs based opportunity. And so to me, not being in the meeting, it seems like you want to aim at both of those, but your committee members or the, the group come out, are coming out saying it's, it's route 60. Yes, uh, Adrian did share that with me, and I've already passed it along to the consultants. So we, we need to do a better job framing all of this. Yeah. yeah, I think, and I think you did just a minute ago when you said, you know, big elephant here, and we're just going to take a bite out of it. And I think you've said it before. Chances are that bite's going to be central, centered on the central business district, and you know, go out as far as we can north south, but it's going to leave out a lot of. The yeah. fringe, yeah, for the moment. Yeah, and while we get service for one thing on Route 60, which right now there is none. <laughs> yeah, or so I think also when you do the mapping, even for what is already in place with bus rapid transit, even if you put it in a different color, just so that people can make that yes. visual connection to what is already there, mm -hmm. um, so that people are. Really, um, but Logan, I don't know how far Logan, you're talking about that. Yeah, and when you look at these red lines, these red lines go way further than the current PRT. <laughs> yeah, right. It yeah. Is a so mm -hmm. for anyone to be thinking that this north south BRT is going to mean we're going from Hanover all the way to. Um, could I also, could we also have a list of who stakeholders are? Certainly. Who's the members of that board? Yes. And then when you are having meetings, not that we're going to attend them all, but at least some of them we might um, be interesting to us to hear. Certainly. Okay, thank you. The, the next round of stakeholder or advisory committee meetings will be in late March, and we also are planning our first round of public engagement in late March, um, looking at the 27th and 28th of those meetings. Do we have projected budget? To so, cover any costs for whatever we decide for that construction. Potential, yeah. No. So this is the first step. And if you go to the next slide, Joe, uh, I wanted to mention this is going to be a multi-study process. We're probably looking at with the different phases of you know engineering and design and construction uh, and having to go through the, the federal project development process and being able to apply for state funds, which are always six years out at smart scale. Um, probably the earliest we could possibly open would be late 2028, um, but that would be tight. Um, so we're, we're going as fast as we can, but this is going to be a long road and we're going to be looking at you know, securing funding as early and as often as we can. Right. I guess to be a little perspective, the first one was $65 million in 2016 dollars, and this is most likely double the length, potentially. We do someone inside. Um, 130 and then multiply by two. Again, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> that. The existing. The existing. Yes. It may be just semantics, but I think that, and I'm fine wherever it goes, but the, the term North South PRT study sort of implies North South. And so <laughs> when, you, when, you, when, you start to, when you start to bring in the other ones, it, it may be more logical to say, BRT expansion study or something like that, so that you're not pigeonholing expectations as well. Why are we even talking about this? Because perception is reality. Yeah, and I think that will kind of the frame will advance as well. Okay. All right, the next one, uh, we're also doing um, 
a Western BRT corridor analysis. Uh, we're working uh, with Plan RVA, who's actually doing the yeoman's work on this. Uh, we did a park and ride study last year to look at could we locate a new park and ride facility near the existing end of line at Willow Lawn uh, because of the parking concerns there. Uh, we didn't find a suitable location. So this effort kind of grew out of that. You know, maybe we should look a little further afield, a little further down Broad Street, and maybe look at a one to three station extension of BRT that could also include a new park and ride facility. Um, and maybe we can find a suitable site there. So this is just kind of, this plan RDA work is designed to say, how far out do we need to look? Um, and that'll limit our study area so that we can be kind of more responsible with our funds in the next phase of study where we do more in-depth environmental clearance, the traffic work, uh, that more detailed look. Um, if we have a narrower study area, it's gonna be cheaper to do all that. So that's kind of the thought here. Um, so right this, now you're just defining how far west. Yes, yeah. there, there are plans that call for, you know, eventual BRT to short pump. We, we don't need to go that far. Yet. Um, so again, what's the first idea? Is that for the, all of the dots there? Is that, is that potential ridership opportunities? Is it? <laughs> no, that's because I didn't have a good graphic for the slide. Um, this was part of a. <laughs> that's uh, odd work. Yes. <laughs> uh, this is transitory. We didn't look at that many things. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this actually came out of a survey that Plan RVA conducted for this analysis, uh, where they asked uh, people to identify uh, areas where there's pedestrian issues and you know, transit accessibility issues, where we need more bus stop infrastructure, where we need more service. Um, and you know, Is it the standard red's not good? Uh, no, actually, well, all the yes, dots are red's. Are not good. Those are needs, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. But uh, I think the different, they're different that represents shapes. represents the need to potential earlier. Yes, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the survey also did show that uh, more public transit service was kind of the biggest uh, issue that people had with yeah. the corridors. So. so the question I guess I have is bus rapid transit I'm talking about like greater uh B dot is it still be that mm -hmm. um so B dot tends to feel like wherever you want development to happen we build a highway um I mean some of these highways that they've built is that a darn thing nowhere on them but trees and woods, you know, and years later it fills in. Bus rapid transit seems to be more about moving people to where things are, not being incentivizing, even though you're going to get some of that growth. So when you look at north south, down the old Jefferson Davis corridor that goes down Route 1 all the way out to Hanover. Someone's like, D dot. <laughs> well, that, that's where then that's it where is it with the West um, bus rapid transit. I mean, you've got lots of businesses, and lots of growth, and lots of opportunities for jobs. And, you know, if you're trying to get people to a location that is thriving already rather than create a bus rapid rapid transit. Yeah, and I think the data will bear that out as we get further into that yeah. cell study. Well, I think it's already. Yeah. There's, there's, a, there's a boat man component to it because in, in laying out the transit, you want to plan for expanding locations, but you also don't want to do it at a huge deficit of yeah. revenue year yeah, over year. Right. And, and something like this or 60 or whatever, that 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 gains reputational uh, it, it it improves your reputation in the community as something other than a needs only use. Mm -hmm. I, I could I mean this is the Western version of BRT. If, if this image were to come out like this, huge ridership, like you say, huge ridership, and people it becomes more the norm of, of, of that as an option in in Richmond in the Richmond region, yeah. which is one of my Hopes that we're heading for this. All right. Um, so those are kind of three of the big ones we've got going on right now, but we do have many other projects in the pipeline either underway or you know, set to begin soon. Uh, you'll see a selection of those here on this chart. Uh, I will not read through it, but um, Joe, if you could click on the link. Nice to draw a presentation, but I apologize. Turning purple. 
Um, so we have begun to kind of create a story map for our major capital projects. And this is a very rough draft. Hopefully the map will pop up, uh, mm -hmm. keep scrolling. But uh, just kind of showing in uh, an additive manner as you scroll through. Okay, it's loading. You gotta get it. You gotta go slow. Yeah. 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 We're so this is GIS based. Yes, it's GIS based, um, and just kind of layering on, you know, like a layer cake kind of. You know, here's the BRT studies we've got going on, and you know, here's the articulated bus uh, or the articulated vehicle modifications that we need to make to our existing BRT stations to accommodate those new articulated vehicles. Uh, you know, here's where we're planning to have new transfer facilities. Uh, here's some route extensions. Um, but as you this. The link is in the uh, presentation and that'll be shared with you if you want to scroll through. Uh, it's not quite ready for prime time, but you know, board members can prove. Uh, but we will be kind of fleshing that out. Uh, we envision that as being something that's kind of public facing um, so we can let people know what we've got in the pipeline and what's going on in GRTC. So that was kind of a response to your last. Interview. That's huge. That's really huge because that 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 is a pointing object. You can basically say to people who want to know information, people who might complain, people like us, board members want to know more information. If it's if it's accurate data in there and it's well set up, we can get answers in a second. Mm -hmm. and, we, and, it, and it's story mapping, it's our GIS, yes. it is, I'm glad you're doing it. That's fantastic. Go all the way to the end, just so we can see. So the idea is in the, by 2029, this could be our system. Um, and the majority of the stuff is at some phase funded, Mm -hmm. um, and of course, we would add to it as more, more but it's, it's, it's been kind of layers on. So you can see, like, you see all of them with the microtransit zones, the expansion of the poles, the Melbourne station with an infill, our uh, new amenities, and then the two nodes for um, transfer facilities as well. Yep. This is the story, man. One of our interns. All, all right. right. Yes. Good. Way to go, yeah. compliment. I will. Right. Do you think that you could include that um, chart, which has all of your projects yes. in the board packet, just on a regular basis, so we can see where we are? Yeah, we can do that. And then it's got that link in there, too. So okay. when people pull it up, they don't have access to it. Mm -hmm. Good idea. Good yeah, let's start off. So the, what is it called? The CBT. CBTA? CBTA. CBTA. Mm -hmm. So they have lots of projects that they are doing as well. Um, I'm thinking about infrastructure support systems to any transportation arteries that we're trying to do planning for and making sure that the localities um, buying into that concept and, reckon, and putting money in the budget where other infrastructure is needed that we won't put in place, but would be necessary to support, um, making sure that we're aligning that. And so, you know, if you said this, you know, you're talking a long range plan, really. So if the city has a long range plan uh, for our capital improvements, we want to see our projects aligning. You know, I have a very brief one you want to jump into mind yeah. and let Mike go over his because it's a recommendation for the board. But you want to do the regional? Yes, yeah, she's, she's leading them with her yeah. request. Yes. All right, just kind of um, exactly what you're talking about and what you had asked for when we talked to you a lot. Just, you know this one already, but just this is our how we kind of fit in the footprint of regional coordination. We have you guys um, as far as the several jurisdictions we work with, the representation. You know, that's one. Um, this is how we are it's interwoven into the various planning organizations. So we actually do a voting seat on the policy board. So working with all nine jurisdictions in that. Um, we sit on TAC as well. Um, we sit on CDTA. We have nine voting seats, both from the authority as well as um, the TAC. And so we are involved in that. I know that they have quite a few projects. We can't do regional prioritization projects, but we could work with you guys meaning Chesterfield and Rico City, and if you guys had something that was transit through you, something could have been applied for for the 50%, but of course the process for that. Um, and then there's several other studies that are done. Uh, we have to do our CSP that Sam had mentioned earlier, 
Um, that's a requirement for our DOTT. But we work with all the jurisdictions to get that because we get your priorities. The long range transportation plan, which is done by the TPO, where everything has to be in there for the constraints of all those BOTs, all those expansions, all of that stuff is in there. Um, a lot of our stuff that's more BOT is in the unconstrained. Um, and we update that as they update to stay coordinated on that. Uh, we do our regional public transportation, which is also through the TPO or CBTA. Um, so lots of coordination on that. And then the vision plan, which is DRPT, which is very transit focused. We have several iterations of that that have actually fed into those other studies above. And then we want to go one more, I think it's what I have. So funding opportunities, what you just talked about. Um, smart scale, we have those conversations. We actually have 10 seats, thank you, Tom. Um, that we 10 spots now for, we used to have four, but realizing our population wasn't always being captured, they expand to 10. But a big benefit of that is GRTC does not have that many projects. For example, we had one live of uh, the time before. And so the other nine, we actually offered to the city. Um, so Mike Sawyer, I think, tried to took like four of them. Um, Henrico took three and Chesterfield took three. And they get to apply for things that are transit related. Um, or next one, the transportation alternative funds. We worked with Mike Sawyer where we applied for ADA improvements on things where he may have had bigger projects for sidewalk improvements and we paid for a piece of it. Um, same with Merritt, we okay. met with everyone here. Okay. Another big one, uh, CMAC, where the city can do more because you guys have the resources. We will provide you guys with scopes and you guys will apply for funds and actually do the projects. And then um, you guys all, the infrastructure bill money, the city applied um, and got the set by city. And right, you applied that $1.2 million. Um, and we ended up being recipients of the funds and are working with them. And then buses and bus facilities, there's other ones related to transport and development. So we're trying to stay ahead and continue to coordinate um, with the, the region of the jurisdiction. So it is happening. Um, okay. And it's, 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 it's a dirty that. secret that people don't know about, but it happens behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Yes, it happens very often. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and even with land development projects that we've done. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. true. Things that have already down the pipeline as well. Yeah. Just want to make sure we are at the table. Yes. 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 We appreciate yes. that. Yeah. Um, let's pass that to the thing. This is about the operator recruitment campaign. So after we uh, try to. Go through this and hope you guys too long, but I wanted to take a minute and brief you guys on our recruitment campaigns. So basically, just give you a little bit of a background. Uh, in September 2022, the board uh, approved 1.1 million for recruitment campaign buys, um, and that's been pretty effective. But we want to make sure that we're still hitting our marks and we're still able to get the right people in to, uh, you know fill the needs that we need. Mm -hmm. So just to give you a little bit more of a background in the recruitment campaign, what we're currently doing, uh, GRTC is, has, currently has media buys in four of the local TV markets. Uh, it's ABC, NBC, Fox, Richmond, and CBS. Uh, our campaign is focused on broadcast TV and digital efforts. And we're trying to reach you know, the correct targeted audience that we wanna reach. Our tactics for this campaign include social displays, targeted videos, CBT and OTT, uh, pre-roll videos, YouTube, TrueView, and targeted emails. And I'll go through those a little bit more and give you a little bit more information about those. Uh, on a monthly basis, we meet with the TV stations uh, to review the performance of our recruitment campaigns. We go through the analytics. Uh, and we also make any needed adjustments or changes if we need to move money to a different um, sector, we can do that at that time. Uh, but we try to make sure we go through there and make sure we're hitting the marks and meeting the parameters that we want to be. Uh, the first part of this tactic is broadcast, and this pretty much is the local news, prime, daytime, and sports. Uh, NBA right now, we're teetering down towards the end of football, which has been a major area for us, uh, but we still have the NBA, we've got uh, college basketball, so we still have you know very good events that we can be prominent in. Um, our reach is 97.7%. And this is basically the number of people in a target audience uh, that are exposed to a single ad served. 
Um, and this is also helpful because it gives us an opportunity to uh, just make sure we're in the right audience and to analyze the effectiveness of our campaigns. Our impressions delivered, this is basically over the lifetime of the campaign. Um, and what we're looking at here is about 9 million, over 9 million. Uh, and this was, this is delivered to somebody's feet. So if you're in a house, it comes on, that's pretty much an impression. Um, the frequency is 19.3, and that's over the lifetime of the campaign as well. The average view frequency is measured, the average number of times unique users view the GRTC ad across a time period. So the first one, 97.7, that is that means that if in a, in a, a buy area of 100,000, 97,000, 97,700 see it at least once. At least once. At least once. Yes, sir. And the difference at the bottom one is that the average people, the average people who see it, they see it 19 times. Right, over the lifespan of the campaign. What's what's that time thing? Uh, well, we the money that was paid for the last campaign was uh, I want to see was September to October, 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 October through March. In March. I think I skewed that 19.3 up a bit. I saw it pay more than that. We even each other out. <laughs> I think it was on the Grammy so I mean, Yeah. Ooh, cool. yeah. Ooh. Ooh. yeah. Uh, the next part of this tactic is our digital side, uh, social displays. I'm not going to read through each one of these, but basically, we have social display ads that kind of mimics what you would see on like Facebook or Instagram. Um, and that usually has a pretty high standard rate uh, because more people are used to seeing that type of display uh, in their Instagram feeds and on their Facebook pages and things of that sort. Targeted videos, our audience we have here is uh, 22 through 65. And these are job seekers in the state of Virginia. CTV, which is connected television and OTT, which is over the top. Uh, that's deliver our commercials in a digital streaming environment. Over the top is usually pretty good because it's not skippable. Uh, as opposed to your pre-roll videos, these videos are basically seen through the entirety. Um, and so we get you know, the opportunity to make sure that we get the message across. Pre-roll videos deliver your TC's message to users as they consume the video content across networks, uh, premium website, and mobile apps. Um, as I said before, these ones are skippable. But you know, we still have the opportunity to at least plant that seed in the viewer's mind, whether they come back to it later or don't. You know, at least we have an opportunity to make our presence felt. Uh, YouTube videos, uh, as you see there, and the targeted emails. We've had a lot of success with targeted emails. Um, our age demographic is 20 to 65. And these emails are going out to basically job seekers in the transportation industry in the state of Virginia. Uh, these emails are deployed. Click through our uh, click rates on these. The first initial email is pretty high. Uh, then a second email is sent out in a couple of days after that first one is going out. Um, and this gives us an opportunity to at least start that conversation. This is a, some of the stats on our OTT streaming videos um, and our e blast. This is an example of some of the stats. Overall, the performance is pretty high on that. Uh, impressions, 16,000, completions, 14,000, a completion rate of 86.18%. So that's a very good you know, completion rate for OTT videos. And as I said before, you know, it's something that you can't skip. So you're investing in it at this point. So I slide and kind of summarize what I was saying in the beginning. But as we move forward, what we're hoping to do is extend the current campaign that we are currently running, which will end in March. So we would like to extend this through from April to the end of the fiscal year, June. Um, and what we want to do is continue what we have. We can see that what we've been doing has had some success. You can see on the table below the number of operators and mechanics that we have had from the time we started through December of 2022 uh, of mechanics and operators that have applications that have come in through the month. So to date, uh, we've scheduled 
from November to date, we've scheduled 15 operator interviews and seven mechanics. Any question? I know I can't. How many hire? The whole five operators. And we have to factor in there's the holidays, people are out. Typically, around the holidays, people don't want to change positions. So that's why the numbers are lower in the um, December time frame during the holidays. So, how many hires the for the fullness of the campaign since well, October? Yeah, it's five. It's five for operators. Okay. But if we do the whole campaign from December 2020. Oh, December yeah. 20. I do not have it on the top of my head. I'm sorry. Are you getting feedback on the hires, even the candidates, as to where they're finding us? Uh, yes. So, in the meetings that we've had, what we want to do, and this is one of the suggestions that I had, is at least on our applications, put more parameters on the application so we can track where the applicants are seeing or uh, viewing our um, commercials and spots. So that we can track that once we are getting those applications after the door. Right now, it just has the option of TV, other, our website, and you saw there that even though it's media by like six other options. So if you don't select TV, your option isn't actually there. So they're not actually selecting it. So the information is probably skewed for what we do have. I was just thinking the way we live and operate these days, the idea of a television impression is so much less valuable because you can't say, send to your cousin or you right. send to your brother, this is what you've been left, whatever. Yeah. So something that has something that's left on your phone or on your, it seems to me that it would be much more effective. Right. Yeah, it's just sort of how we're wired nowadays. So you need another media buy yes, for recruitment. Yes, and, oh, you're, yeah. and you're going to the board in March to request that? This what was the budget federal, again? It's February. February. This, this, this oh, month, sorry. Yeah, it was yeah. recommendations from the board for this month for 550. Yeah, five, 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 Oh, well, very popular, so. Gotta pay the premium prices. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Is this wage at 17? I recall some board members mm -hmm. saying something about which of public schools pay their drivers more than we do. Are we competitive with these with that wage that's being advertised? Oh. I mean, because every time I look at it, it says 17. I'm like, okay. That's like, the only way we are competitive now is because of the incentive that we're offering. There's a $2 an hour incentive on top of the current uh, rate. Current rate is $17.43, so it takes it to $19.43. However, we need to make that permanent. That's just an incentive for that. Um, so yeah, you're correct. School bus, um, they do offer more than we do as well as DCU. Did you still do sign on? Yeah, we still do sign on. So yes, so the sign on bonus. So do some of the school systems. Uh, yes, they do. Ours is five thousand. I'm not sure if there is as much, but but they offer. So I don't understand the incentive, the two dollar incentive. Mm -hmm. um, but every hour work, you get two dollars an hour additional on top of your regular hourly rate. And then if you work nights and weekends at the 6 p.m. and all weekends, it's four dollars an hour oh. to encourage people to work those hours that are not as popular. We had incentives in there before. Night shifts would be 30 cents per hour or more. Um, but since we can't necessarily open the contract yet, the incentive was a way for us to increase all those without actually increasing the base. Oh, I see. Yes. Yeah, that's the, the rates are in the contract. So in order to So you're just, locked into that 17 in the contract. Yes. So yes. okay. So, so you have five cars. How many applications have you received? Listen, that was that was actual 65. Mm -hmm. Um in December it was 68 operators, November it was 69, October 59. 45 and it's on the last page. Yeah, and so then it does hire not everybody makes it through the training program. 
That's correct. Yes, yeah. or actually through the um, screening of the application, depending on um, background and all of that. So yes. Okay. This is there. They see people are looking. They're applying. They're coming through. But there's several other factors that I think we are also looking at in terms of like. Uh, Ashley mentioned the timing and holidays, yes. uh, HR processing, yes. our classes. You know that people are submitting an application, they don't hear anything in two weeks, they may have moved on. Um, so trying to also catch up to that mm -hmm. at the same time. They didn't bring them in, but if they didn't come to you, then they will probably need. Also, our staffing as well. Sometimes we don't want to bring in too many because our training staff might not be able to take all of that one time. So we have to sign up correctly so we're not overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. that size. Yeah. yeah. Curiosity more than anything else. Do you know the percentage of what the broadcast uh, advertising cost is versus on the other? What percentage of total cost? Oh, I would have to take a look at the numbers. No, I'm not looking for them right now. Oh, I was just curious if, we could, if you could find that. So, it, sure. again, it goes back to that efficiency of money spent in, yeah. in, in the way the, the way we look to these things. So I bet there's a disproportionate expense on things that don't have as much click to. Yeah. yeah, that's what we found is the doing public outreach with social media is just so much more cost effective. Yeah. yeah. Um, are you giving this presentation to the operations committee also? Tomorrow? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Oh, well, no, I wasn't. I just, <laughs> I just wanted to know. But actually, it was a question I had. Is, is, this is great, and I'm glad to get it, but I was just trying to figure is there is action we have to do? To me, it seems like it fits under operations more than development. And whether there's any, because you said that there's going to be an ask for an extension of that, is that something we're recommending to the full board or is it a small that? Yeah, it was more about the media by aspect in terms of just the where structured development oversees the marketing. See, they're figured with an ISIS committee and we're so yes. yeah, because <laughs> yeah. it is sort of you know, you know, finding <laughs> yeah, yeah, because of the money that yeah. we're asking. So maybe we should, but I could say operations would care too in terms of so maybe go to the, just the board. Yes. So it seems like a full board thing yeah. with a very simple overview because that's right. Yeah, we had it right now on the consent agenda, but we can't. Yeah, yeah. Well, but I don't think you should bring it to the board with an ask for extension of funding if you haven't run it for finance at some point. Okay, we'll do that this tomorrow. Finance is tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Oh, okay, yeah, that seems okay. good. And uh, we'll. Both the time. Uh, operation. Yes, yes, one at 12 30, one at 3. We'll stay. That was very informative. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it looks like we've made it through the agenda. Is there any other business? Okay. Then I think so I don't know whether okay. it's operations or not, but I just I wanted to mention what I mentioned to you, I think, after the first or second meeting. I, I think it was great to go through the, um, the, the maintenance facility as a board member to learn a little bit more about it. I think it would be really an amazing thing for us, and it's probably is more operations, uh, to all as board members find the time to schedule to get on their simulator and actually oh. pretend to be a bus driver mm -hmm. and see how actually hard it is to do. <laughs> you see, have you seen your simulator? It's, it's big. Yeah, I, it's, um, um, I, I just, because I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it, and I, I think it would be. Was, the other, just last night, I'm thinking, oh, my God. I think it would be really cool perspective for us to know what that line of sight is for them on a regular basis. Just an appreciation level. I don't know if there's anything about that that needs to be in the committee. I just think we all would do it. So. Happy to do it. Mm -hmm. I noticed with your ads, those two that were up there, and, and the ones I have seen, women are featured. And I'm wondering whether or not, I mean, we was, and they are minority women. Mm -hmm. yes. What was it, 63%? But I think your advertisers um, know what, yeah. Our mm -hmm. That's best. Oh, our, 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 yeah. yeah. What do you think? The next day, the next day, it be me behind the simulator. Yeah, that's right. 
like that's a good idea. It's not going to attract <laughs> anybody. Not good idea. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. Um, not to but you know, I'm just I think I'm thinking about it from the perspective that the wage is low, and then the ads have minority females. It's the message that I'm a little concerned about. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. The news we put in on um, our goal is to relaunch some new commercials. We're building some new commercials this summer, so we'll have new content in here. Got and and employees and different employees. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but those are actual employees that you're using. Yes. 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 They yeah. talk yeah. about their experience, which is great. Yeah. I mean, it's a great ad. I'm just thinking about it's a recruitment ad. Right. It's not a acknowledgement of who already is employed, even though that's a good sale, sell, you know, sell pitch. Um, but if it's a recruit, if you're recruiting and your wages are low and your two you know, people are minority females. Yeah. Well, I've seen that mechanic ad. Right. Is it your one with a, a guy? Yeah. yeah. And the happy picture that's um, had uh, one of our Latin um, operators who's now one of our trainers who's mm -hmm. speaking as well. So mm -hmm. we have to diverse. It's just changing. Okay. Good guys. Um, no. Can, can, can we motion to adjourn? Okay. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second. All right. Let's go. <laughs> You so tomorrow again. meeting uh, yes, is here in this room, and I have a two o'clock council standing committee meeting at two. Um, so the agenda, um, sometimes.